Hey, David, how are you? Hey, Tom, so nice to uh, speak with you and meet you. Okay, thank you for your time, David. I think we have a really interesting topic to discuss today. You know, I try to find creative ways also to share with my listeners and that we are a real human beings, right? We are not a podcast that is operated by a bot or an AI machine. And in an AI era, we're looking for more and more human touch. We're looking for more social connections. And I think uh, discussing today about handwritten is probably something that is uh, right in the alley of what I'm looking for. So again, I really appreciate the time. Uh, please share with us uh, about handwritten and what exactly you're, you're doing. Yeah, so handwritten is 10 years old. We are the largest provider of our content. And basically what we do is we help you scale handwritten outreach. So uh, in today's world of AI, where everybody is receiving a thousand emails a day saying, <laughs> just bring in this to the top of your inbox, wanted to make sure you saw my last message, or I love what you're doing at company X, you're really, <laughs> I mean, all that AI baloney, your inbox is becoming overwhelmed and none of it matters anymore. And then you throw in junk mail and Twitter tweets and Facebook and Slack and Teams and everything else, uh, your digital and traditional inboxes are overflowing. But what's not overflowing are the handwritten notes you get. The average American only gets about one to three a month compared to 134 emails a day. So do you want to be in that pile of one to three or that pile of a hundred and some odd? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's what we help you do. Um, real quick on me and my background, prior to doing this, I had a uh, text messaging company. So I was part of the problem. I, we'd send a million texts a day for brands like Abercrombie and Fitch or Toys R Us, um, big brands in the States here. And I realized that everybody's overwhelmed by it. So, that's where handwritten came from. Now we do about 20,000 pieces a day, which is obviously a lot less than a million texts a day, but it's a different medium. And these are on behalf of major brands, luxury brands, car dealerships, retailers, uh, real estate agents, uh, professionals, veterinarian clinics, nonprofits, kind of across the board, we help people connect in a meaningful way at scale. Um, the way we do this is with nearly 200 robots, and we build these robots for our facility in Phoenix. They're 3D printed, laser cut, uh, custom circuit boards that we design. Um, it's all done in-house. We're completely vertically integrated. We build these robots, and then we put them on racks in our facility, and we just write out more and more notes. So that's kind of the secret behind it all. I'm very interested. You mentioned 10 years since founding the handwritten, right? Yes. I'm very interested in the journey. I mean, how, how is it? Uh, yeah. yeah. I mean, is it like so, bootstrap, private, funded, tell us, you know, in terms yeah. of the, the way you scale the company. So my last company, Sell It, was totally bootstrapped. This is the one that did Abercrombie and & Fitch and Toys R Us. Um, I was fortunate enough to sell that company to a private equity backed firm. Um, I worked for the new owners for two years, and then I turned around and I started handwritten the next day. Neither company has taken any funding, but with handwritten, I had the benefit of having an exit from a prior company, so I had some money um, on my own that I was able to invest. Uh, but I still am a strong proponent of growing profitably and organically, not through investment. I did try to get investment during COVID and didn't have much luck actually. Uh, huh. So yeah, so we've been fully, I'm a hundred percent owner. Uh, we were profitable and growing. We've been on the Inc. 500 and 5,000 a few times. Uh, you know, it's just, it's uh, without any investment. I can hundred percent relate because Vimy, we are also bootstrapped and we also celebrated 10 years last month. Right, uh, as, as a company, it's one thing to be to bootstrap, but it's yeah. one other thing to bootstrap for ten years with profitability, right? So, yeah, what are some of the challenges that you had to uh, to face, you know, during these years, and how do you overcome them? 
Well, people are always a challenge, just uh, <laughs> attracting and retaining the best people and keeping them motivated and happy. Um, financially, we started off very small and you know, trying to grow profitably meant kind of uh, containing our growth a little bit. You know, when we started, we didn't have our own robot. We would use off the shelf auto pens. I had to buy these or lease these from a company in Virginia. They were poor quality, but I didn't mm -hmm. have the technical expertise or the, the wherewithal or, or anything else to build my own robots at that time. So for the first four years or so, we used these off the shelf robots. And then we just went through the journey of building our own robots. And, and once we did that, our growth really kind of took off. We were able to um, reduce our cost to scale. So, you know, it used to cost us eight to $10,000 a robot to buy. And now we're able to build them much more cost effectively. And because of that, we can scale faster. So uh, that was one thing, um, you know, this go round versus last company, um, last company had a lot more software programmers in-house. This time I use uh, an outsource team out of Ukraine actually. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, so um, it's just been a little bit of a different experience. Now that team is only responsible for the, what I call commodity programming. So API development, website, iPhone app, Android app, some of our integrations with like HubSpot and Salesforce, that type of thing. Uh, yeah. But core programming, making the robot work, that's in-house in, in, in Tempe, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona. So, uh, you know, we've tried to grow that way a bit by outsourcing where possible. Um, now we're considering outsourcing assembly of the robot to see if that'll be more cost-effective. There, there's a lot of things we're doing there, um, you know, but, but one of the things, I would have to say that as far as growth and scaling this time, that's been a problem is really advertising. And because of the cost of our offering and because we're a relatively low margin offering, going to Google and doing SEM, search engine marketing, has not panned out. And mm -hmm. last year, we actually had a pretty bad year. We um, had to make some pretty big cuts as far as our Google ad spend and 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 that type of thing to keep the company afloat. And since then, we've completely refocused our marketing efforts away from Google and Facebook and social to more traditional advertising and and to building a sales force. Quite honestly, got it. So, what uh, I mean, which which type of personas do you target? What are your uh, you know ICPs? Yeah, it really depends on the vertical. So nonprofits, um, you know, it's head of development, retail, e-tail, it's customer experience manager, um, uh, marketing, um, but really customer experience, head of customer experience. Um, that's probably who you're probably most interested in. And um, it's been very interesting. In the last year, we've seen a lot of interest for our service, mainly the last four or five months yeah, because I think everybody else is kind of feeling the same thing that email is overdone, AI is overdone, everybody's overwhelmed and none of it works anymore. So um, for those reasons, it's it's really kind of helped us in some way. Um, but yeah, sure. got customer experience manager. And what are the major use cases for customers using the technology? Uh, Get ready for something very exciting. Thank you, Nukes. You know, it's Thank it, you, Nukes. The, 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 the best use case is often the most obvious, you know? And so hmm. it's all about just helping people say thank you in a uh, more authentic way. You know, if you're trying to be super authentic, you actually send a handwritten thank you note. But when you're trying to appeal to tens of thousands or million, millions of uh, customers, you can't do that. So. It's about sending an after purchase thank you note and then following up a few more times a year, birthday cards, holiday cards, and then maybe uh, an offer once a year. But we're, we're talking about four to six touch points a year with handwritten notes, not, mm -hmm. not 12, not 100. Sure, sure. So how the process works, assuming a company want to work with handwritten? 
Yeah, you know, the first discussion would be what's your um, CDP? You know, are you using Salesforce? Are you using Shopify? If you're using Shopify, we can integrate directly with Shopify just through our app in the marketplace. If you're using Salesforce, we have plugins there too. Uh, if you're using other systems, we could probably plug in through Zapier or direct API integration. Um, okay. And then it's just, um, you know, what, what are your goals? Is it to thank every new customer? Is it to thank in store customers? Because we do a lot of that too. Uh, we find that businesses with online, which is everybody, but offline customers, um, sometimes you ignore your offline. You have a less uh, engaged customer offline because that store clerk that's walking around your brick and mortar doesn't have time to send a handwritten note or drop an email or a phone call. So we're able to pick up where they left off and provide a uh, uh, an experience that where the offline matches the online, ironically, and improve the offline. So we tie into their data typically through APIs or or SFTP feeds, and then we mm -hmm. uh, send out those notes. And uh, we you need access to pro obviously database of uh, first name, last name, address, right? You manage the Maybe entire the site. Sorry. Yeah. And maybe the product. <laughs> Perfect. The product, and you manage the entire like it's it's a managed service, right? So you ship those the letters to to the target addresses, make sure they are there, right? Yeah. So we put everything with a real American forever stamp, which is, you know, it's not metered mail, it's not marketing mail. It looks like somebody sat down and wrote it. So we do all that um, for you. We we you know we do the whole process soup to nuts. So we print your cards. They're very thick. 120 pound vellum card stock. So nice quality cards. We print those mm -hmm. for you. We write in them, we mail, we address the envelope and we mail it for you. And then we're able to help you report on it, you know, through AB testing or um, whatever you, however you want to test that, we can help you show lift. We do have the opportunity or the technology to do unique QR codes. Uh, but, you know, a lot of people don't like scanning QR codes. so. Mm -hmm. especially people that might react to handwritten notes. You know, sometimes we go after an older demographic. Are they really going to open that handwritten note and scan a QR code, or is mm -hmm. that going to kind of ruin the experience? So, um, you know, some of those fully measurable ways of tracking don't really work with handwritten notes. Yes. So you mentioned A-B testing. Is it related to the, the, to the script or to the font styles or to, you know, look and feel? Style exclusion. So... We sent handwritten notes to group A. We didn't send to group B. Let's see which one worked better. Um, uh -huh. We sent a card with this photo on the front or that logo on the front, which one works better. But mostly just exclusion. Exclusion. You know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. one of our clients is a snack box. They send snacks to your office. And when they screw up and they send you the wrong snacks or delay in sending the snacks or whatever, they'll send you a handwritten note uh, apology with an offer for some free additional snacks. And what they found was those customers that had the win back experience that had the screw up, but received a handwritten note actually have a higher lifetime value than customers that were never uh, had a bad experience in the first place. So mm -hmm. then they just start sending everybody the handwritten note and screwing up with everybody. So um, kind of that's one way we've done it. Um, so there's a lot of a lot of tactics people use to really try to, um, you know, test this. We have other clients, you know, small clients just to make all this real. Uh, we have a client that's a piano tuner and they're in your house one time a year to tune your piano. After tuning your piano, they automatically send you a handwritten note. Uh, you only need your piano tuned once a year. So when you, they return to your house a year later, they often find that note still standing up on the piano. Now, if I sent you a text message, you wouldn't print it out and stick it to the piano. If you, if sure. I sent you an email, you wouldn't do that. But a handwritten note, not only does it get your most prized location on the most expensive piece of furniture in your house and the most fancy room of your house, but it stays there a year. As a marketer, you can't buy that. 
you know, that's, you cannot buy that, but handwritten sure. notes really break through and allow that. Yeah. So I want to ask you about some of the benefits or how, how brands or companies are measure the success of these type of uh, activities. Yeah. So we have auto dealerships across the United States. And, you know, it's really up to them to share their responses with us. We were out of the loop there. But yeah. um, we know that one dealership group typically sends print mail. And when they move to handwritten notes, they saw a 27 times greater response rate. So 2,700% improvement. Um, wow. So even when you take into account the cost additional cost of a handwritten note, and it will be more expensive, they still saw a seven times greater ROI. So, and what they're really tracking there is how many customers are coming into the dealership for that offer. And they saw a 27 times greater response rate. We have a mm -hmm. bespoke suit company that once a year sends out a coupon code in a handwritten note, uh, and they say see a three to five times greater coupon redemption rate for those coupons compared to email coupons. Um, so there's a lot of ways of really measuring this. Um, yeah, those are just those are just the interesting. Few. So yeah, I mean it's kind of a coupon platform. It's an attribution platform. People are yeah. coming in with a specific code or a specific message that that then you can analyze and calculate you know ROI of this type of campaign. Got yes. it. Got it. Interesting. And what are some of the objections that you hear from customers? Uh, does it look fake? <laughs> or are clients going to, are customers going to know this is fake? And how will that negatively impact my brand? So a yeah. couple of things there. Um, please visit handwritten.com. And it's H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-E-N.com. You can request free samples. And I think you'll see for yourself, the only way somebody will know it's fake is if you send them a card or hand them a card and you say, was this written by a robot? If you say, well, was this written by a robot? Of course, they're going to put it under scrutiny hmm. and be like, I think it was. But if you just send them a card and you say, what did you think of my card? Uh, did you receive it? They'll say, oh, that was very thoughtful of you. Thank you so much. I really appreciated that. So. I think that's one part. Um, the other part is, is this less genuine? And to that, what I'll say is genuineness at scale is impossible. So what do, what do I mean by that? We work with a lot of nonprofits. Nonprofits like to send thank you notes to donors. Is it the head of the nonprofit that's sending 10,000 thank you notes? Or do they hire a bunch of interns that are only there for the free pizza? to send the, okay. the, the, the uh, thank you notes. Probably the lab. So is that any more genuine than getting a robot to do it for you at scale? Mm -hmm. um, the United States, every year the president will send a Christmas or holiday card to a bunch of people, you know, tens of thousands of people in the United States. Yeah. And all these people put that Christmas card on their fireplace mantle. Do you think they think that Christmas card is real, that the president <laughs> sat down and signed a card for them? Of course not. But they still yeah. put it on the mantle and they still appreciate it. So what it is, it's just a different way of standing out, a way where you recognize that what you're trying to do is impart some gratitude to the, the end recipient. And people appreciate that, even though they know it might not be totally real. Yeah. And what about like our eyes? It's worth it. I mean, all these type of objections, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, your mileage may vary. It depends on the margin of your uh, product or service. Mm -hmm. I think if you're doing a high margin business, whether it's luxury goods, jewelry, car, um, anything like that. I think there's a true ROI case. I think if you're selling something um, on the lower end, whether that's, I don't know, a backpack or maybe not, um, you know, we do offer prospecting. So you can take an area on a map, circle it, we'll send everybody a handwritten note in that area. I would say that the ROI on that is probably pretty low because 
you're sending a lot of postage. It, it postage alone is 68 cents in the state. So mm -hmm. it's very expensive. But if you have a targeted group and you're trying to capture all ROI, I think it's there. The bigger question is, Aton, and I want your listeners to think about this. If you're asking for ROI on a thank you note, where civilization stand? Where society? <laughs> you know, somebody has chosen you out of all the other millions of choices in the world to buy your service. And you're asking, if I send you a handwritten note, what's the value to me? Um, I think you need to take a look at yourself and wonder, is that where we should be as a society? You should always send a handwritten note. Uh, the question is, how hard is it going to be for you to do it? And are you going to be able to implement it in a consistent and thoughtful way? I think as a society, we've gone off the rails and we're thinking everything has to be measured versus, you know, what's really important. And I, I think saying thank you is important. And, uh, you know, but that's, you know, that's just me. I think, I think that's a bigger argument. And for brands that want to stand out and understand the value of gratitude, I think they'll see that and others just won't. Yes. I mean, retention is so important these days where acquisition has become so difficult, right? And gratitude is a definitely part of retention and, you know, brands trying to allocate their budgets in the right way and to appreciate the value of gratitude. I think it's very, very important. So yeah, truly yeah. You know, happy with this, with this message, of course. Uh, so how do you, how do you define your competition? Well, there's a lot. I mean, there, uh, you know, there's uh, printed thank you cards that look like they're handwritten. There's a small handful of vendors in the United States um, that do this with robots similar to ours now. Um, or there's people sitting down and writing their own handwritten notes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so when you look at the competitive set, A, what's scalable, what looks real, what integrates with your platform, who provides the level of support you need, meaning a full account management team, customer service, somebody that answers the phone. What printing capabilities do they have? You know, as far as printing the card first and how does that look? Um, not just the note itself. And I think, and, and who has the best reputation uh, on G2 or any of these other services? So um, I think those are all things to really look at. But there are certainly, yeah. you know, competitors, whether they're laser printed cards that look handwritten or other direct competitors in our space. Sure, sure. And how the pricing works? Uh, volume. Um, so the more you send or the more you buy, the less it's going to be. So if you, you know, we like to get clients on invoice where at the end of every month, um, they, they just pay for the volume they use and, and what we do is we actually scale it over a year. So if you send one card in January and then 500,000 in February and then two in March, you're still going to pay very little in March because you've sent okay. so many in February. So we kind of scale it over the course of a year. And, you know, starting, it's going to be $3.75 for note one. If you go to our website and you just send a single card, but then over the course of a year, it could get down to less than a dollar pretty quickly. Wow. Got it. Got it. And uh, you mentioned 2023 was kind of a challenging year for you. Yeah. How do you, how do you, do you see any correlation between the overall macroeconomic status to, to the business or what's usually triggers growth in the business and what do you do in this year to, to accelerate growth? So. Yeah, you know, I've been at trade shows where other print vendors and similar companies came up to us. We were chatting and uh, I said, yeah, last year was tough. And they said, oh, yeah, last year was very tough. So I think other people mm -hmm. in Q1, Q2 of last year, I don't know if you experienced this, Aton. Um, I think there was a lot of uncertainty in the market. And because of that, people were holding back on spending. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the stock market went up, everything looked great, but I think people are just hesitant. Um, this year, it's been a little better. Um, but internally, we've just 
really kind of sharpened the pencil and decided we're not going to spend on Google ads. It's, it's attracting the wrong customer. We're going to get where the customer is. So now we go to a lot of trade shows. Um, I'm heading to another trade show next week. Uh, mm -hmm. And so a lot of trade shows, you know, boots on the ground. And then we have an, an SDR team to reach out to customer opportunities as well. So it's much more direct. It's getting where the customer is, uh, much less waiting for customers to come to us because that's a very expensive, it's a very expensive uh, proposition. In our space, you know, a lot of, most companies have not tried sending handwritten notes. You know, they do email, they do text, they do social media, but they don't do handwritten notes. And there's what's called the BCG matrix. Have you ever heard of the BCG matrix? So what oh, that is, is it's like a four by four quadrant. Mm -hmm. And in the lower and on the one uh, one axis is yeah. customer, uh, new customer or existing customer, and existing is at the bottom because that's the easiest. And then product, new customer is the hottest, hardest, existing is the easiest. So if you draw it in, you're selling an existing product to an existing customer is easy. Selling a new product to an existing customer is also a little bit, but selling a new product to a new customer is hard. And that's what we do because we only yeah. have one product, uh, you know, uh, handwritten notes robotically sent, so that's new, and it's always a new client. So trying to find um, customers through SEM is very, very difficult that way. So we just don't do it. And then I do a lot of podcasts. You know, I, I try to get the word out that way. Yes. So you're heavily yeah. relying on outbound SDRs, exhibitions, boots on the ground, right? talk face to face yes. with prospects. And in terms of yeah. inbound, primarily the podcasting side of things, and right, that's uh, how's it works. So that's yeah. actual optimization, uh, of course. Yeah, SEO. I mean, if you Google handwritten notes, we're probably number one in every category, at least if you're in the United States or North America. Uh, so SEO is very important to us, but um, SEM is not. Yeah. So SEO is something that you continue to invest on a monthly basis, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. In I terms mean, of a lot of content marketing. I don't know. You know, we talked before the show about attribution. I don't know if it does anything. I mean, it makes our <laughs> volumes go up. I don't know if that's converting to sales, but uh, yeah, we do a lot of SEO. Great, great. Thank you for sharing. And David, what are the tips you can, I mean, you've been running a few businesses already quite successfully. What are the tips you can provide to other founders out there? Um, I'd say, uh, number one, there's no better day to start a company than today because <laughs> everybody gets into kind of analysis paralysis where, oh, I'm going to sit down and do a business model and then I'm going to refine the business model and then I'm going to do it again and then I'm going to do a survey. What they need to do is start and actually make a product or a service and go and sell it. Um, additionally, tomorrow, your kids, if you're not married, you'll get married. If you're married, you'll have kids. If, you're, if you have kids, you'll have aging parents. There's always going to be more responsibilities. So today is the day with least responsibilities for you to start mm -hmm. a company. So I would say do it today. I'd also say be patient. You know, um, Rome wasn't built in a day. Most of the t my last company took a solid two years. This company took three or four to get off the ground. Um, and you only lose when you quit. So, you know, you just stick with it if you're passionate about it to make sure it happens. Yeah. Well, I mean, what uh, inspired you to launch Handwritten? I mean, it's not your first business. It's not just also the standard business. It's not a SaaS company that everyone is doing probably or a brand or, or what's uh, make it special and why, why you're so passionate about that specific area. I wish it was a SaaS. Uh, <laughs> so the, uh, I saw a need. I, when I sold my last company, I was sending handwritten cards to my best employees and to my best customers, and it became hard. And I wish there was an automated way to do it. So that's, I also didn't know what I would do next. So I got a little uh, desperate and I started handwritten. And here we are 10 years later, so go figure. Amazing. 
Nice, nice, nice. Uh, David, uh, we would love to hear a fun fact about you that most of your professional network are not aware of. Uh, I've been fortunate to eat dinner with uh, Conan O'Brien and Danny Glover, uh, Dr. Ruth Westheimer, and some others. And really? uh, through, through college, actually, and, and <laughs> in college, uh, Conan O'Brien gave me some words of advice that I've listened to, and it's kind of words I live by, which is always get in over your head. And um, I think it's really true. I think, you know, you really need to get in over your head to grow. You can't, if you're stuck in your safe spot, you're never going to grow. And, and I think we all need to get out of our safe, safe space. So how do you do that? To just uh, be more, you know, take, take more uh, risks, take Risk. more bold yes. decisions, right? Start Don't be afraid running. to fail, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When when life gives you lemon, uh, when life gives you lemons, start a company. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's there's a, a saying in the summary. states. Uh, there's a uh, I don't know if you've heard it in, in the states. When life gives you lemons, make lemonade. Sure, that's a very yeah. common saying in the states. I say when life gives you lemons, start a company. Start a company. Uh, with sell it. My last company, I got fired from my job, and. Uh, I was also broke and evicted from my apartment and in a car accident and it was flooding. So I had a bad time and I uh, wow. started a company and then it was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. So no figure. And how do you learn? You, you have like a mentor or you study like from day to day life experiences? Um, I listen to podcasts um, and uh, follow I, I kind of have the figure it out gene. You just, I just know that if I don't know something, I can figure it out. Mm -hmm. And whether that's Googling or more than likely trial and error, you know, beating your head against the wall for two to three years, that's kind of the way I do it. And I try to surround myself with really good people. Um, in my, my company now, I'm, I'm fortunate to have an amazing head of operations, an amazing head of engineering, um, I really try to surround myself with smart people. Nice. Great. David, anything else you want to add? No, I just say, you know, please uh, visit handwritten.com, H-A-N-D-W-R-Y-T-T-E-N.com. If you're in Phoenix or the uh, Phoenix area, please stop by. We'll show you how we build robots and use them. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. Amazing, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck. It's been a pleasure. Wish you an amazing Thank year you. and a bright future for the company. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.